All right, we'll talk about uh, carcass grading, quality and yield, a little more in depth than we did yesterday for the uh, live animal eval. So I've got USDA beef grades, quality on the left, yield on the right. If I were to paraphrase that into some, just a couple of words, quality summarizes how good, and yield summarizes how much. How good and how much, okay? So quality prime choice select standard, those are our young grades of beef, typically found in restaurants and supermarkets across the U.S. and the world. The old beef is in red, commercial utility cutter canner. So they represent coal cattle, coal cows primarily. Commercial would be those that are higher in marbling. Utility would be those that are lower in marbling. And the cutter canner would be very old, practically devoid of marbling, uh, representative of that old, old cow that I showed you with the catabolism photo. Say that again, sir. Bulls, yes, bulls also fall into commercial utility cutter canner. Most bulls would be utility, primarily. Uh, and the yield grades one through five, one is heavy muscled and lean, five is lighter muscled and fat. So these values represent where we were as a country last week. So last week our cattle graded 9% prime, 32% premium choice, 40, 41% low or commodity choice, 15% select, 3% no roll. And two thirds of our population is black hided, black hair coat. Technically, two thirds of the population is 51% black hair coat. Or we would traditionally call that Angus influence in some manner. Okay? And you can pull this report up every day of the week at that address right there. So if we look at quality grading, our, our second piece of that beyond uh, marbling is maturity. And I've got A's, B's, C's, D's, and E's. Driven by what hormone? Estrogen. Fantastic. So this A maturity, we're looking at the buttons or the cartilaginous tips at the end of the spinous processes of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. If these are all cartilage, we call that an amaturity animal, and as they advanced, we make subjective determinations of their physiological advancement in age. A B maturity animal is starting to ossify, a C has greater ossification, a D is even greater near full ossification, and an E animal, the entire cartilaginous tip has converted into hard cancellous bone. Okay? Poorly. Very poorly linked to teeth <clears throat> because that is driven by estrogen. It's more strongly linked to teeth in a heifer that was not spayed and not bred. So if you have a virgin heifer, that would be the strongest relationship of all cattle outcomes. If you have a steer, you removed his source of estrogen, so there's almost zero relationship now. The same would be said for a spayed heifer, because they have no, no more hormone, so there's no relationship. And then you can have a, a, a cow and a bull that advance very early, faster than the teeth. So extremely poor correlation. No, that's, that is irrespective of teeth. So any of those teeth outcomes could occur in any maturity category. This percentage uh, um, are of total slaughter in the U.S.? Yes, yes. fed beef, not, not, uh, oh, not yeah. coal beef. That's fed yeah, beef slaughter, yeah, yeah. fed beef slaughter. A, a, a bull? Yeah, bull? So no. most bulls would be D and E. D and E. It would be a rare bull that is younger than that. If, if a bull comes in this stage, it was probably either infertile or injured. But with a bull, I mean uh, an animal 
to be arranged the age arranged 20 to 22 months. 20 to 22 months, probably in this area. So a, a two-year-old bull should have some minor ossification. In Italy, 99% of animals are under 24 months. Sure. But because they still have intact testicles, uh -huh. they're still going to ossify bone. And you should find bones that look approximately like this picture. A reproductive bull. A productive bull? Yes. An old coal bull is down in this category. D and E. There is also an adjustment in our maturity system for the lean color. Color of the lean is controlled primarily by quantity of myoglobin. Myoglobin is the protein in muscle that stores oxygen for aerobic metabolism. As an animal ages, it accrues more and more and more and more myoglobin. Okay? So on the very left, you see a kind of a light pink color. And we call that A20. How many of you in here have had veal? What is the muscle color of veal prior to cooking? Pink. Pink. Once you cook it, white. So veal looks very similar in color to pork, both raw and cooked. So veal would be its own box over here, left of that. Very, very young beef. And as an animal ages, it accrues and accumulates more and more and more and more myoglobin. So back to your question, the old bull that was in production for several years would be right here. Dark meat because it has accrued and accumulated large quantities of myoglobin. Most of our fed steer and heifer beef is right here. And you'll occasionally find some over here in the bee maturity. So young steer and heifer beef right here. This is the cull cow beef over here, the older animal that has accumulated more myoglobin. Dark cutter. Yes, sir. Okay, so a dark cutter is caused by long-term stress prior to slaughter. So let me give you some scenarios. And I'll get to a dark cutter picture in a minute. Can I hold that till I get there? Let me hold that till I get there. Okay. So uh, this image right here is of our USDA quality grading chart, if you will. We have nine levels of marbling, practically devoid through abundant, and we have five levels of maturity. Each of those marbling and maturity levels has 10 degrees within it. So there's 50 levels of, of uh, maturity, 90 levels of marbling. You put those together, that makes 4,500 possible combinations to get to one of those seven quality grades. Okay? Recently, uh, just over a year ago, we updated our maturity system and altered this a bit. So let me, let me explain how we did that. Because of the BSE regulation, we were already monitoring their dentition, their teeth. And last year we said if they have less than three permanent teeth, which means they have two, one, or zero permanent teeth, then those cattle are automatically eligible for young beef grades, prime choice select standard, unless, the, and the unless portion is, unless they're actually D or E maturity at the time of grading. So what it did is it eliminated the B and C grade. Cattle that are less than 30 months are now A's, or their bones say they're really D's and E's. Cattle that are greater than 30 months of age, so those that have three, four, five, six, seven, or eight permanent teeth, they were graded or will be graded under the original system, A, B, C, D, E, and the marbling scores. So we made it a little more complicated last year. Okay? Yield grading, we covered this last night. Another quick review. 
Uh, those are the percentages last week. And as I said earlier, you now have a greater per chance, a greater probability of having a prime carcass in the United States than you do a yield grade one. Uh, there's there's a, decent, uh, a decent shift there. So uh, not quite 6% yield grade ones, 35% twos, about 48% threes, 10% ones, and almost 2% fives. That's, uh, that's how we graded last week. And uh, that's report, that report is updated uh, constantly by USDA. That was the most recent report right there. Fat thickness is the primary driver of our yield system. It's the number one most important factor in measuring uh, carcass yield. And Dr. Tennant's going to go over that with the carcasses that are hanging in the cooler later this afternoon. Ribeye area is also another important metric. We document how large the ribeye is and we measure it in square inches. Uh, in common teaching, we use what we call a dot grid. You count the dots that are within the uh, circumference of the ribeye. Each dot is equivalent to one-tenth of a square inch. <clears throat> we evaluate the internal fat, the KPH, if you will, uh, by a visual estimate. The uh, carcass on the left has visually less pelvic fat, kidney fat, and heart fat than those on the right. So as we advance from left to right, there's increasing quantities of internal or KPH fat. So <clears throat> all of those factors come together, and there's two equations that have been developed from those four factors. The first one was the percentage boneless, closely trimmed rib loin chuck and round. Boneless, closely trimmed rib loin chuck and round. And we can predict an estimate of roasts and steaks out of those four primals. It does not take into account the brisket, the plate, and the flank. So it only takes into account the major four primals, chuck, rib, loin, and round. That system was also indexed in the 1960s to make it a one through five score. And those indexes were meant to represent 2.3% incremental changes in boneless, closely trimmed, rib, loin, round, and chuck. And today, uh, the grader is estimating that equation mentally, or the camera grading system is doing it uh, mathematically with an algorithm, depending on where those cattle are marketed. And somebody asked me last night how we do it, and my answer, very truth, was every way possible. From a human does everything, to a human does some, and the camera does some, to a camera does everything and a human does nothing. And uh, so we have a, a non-standard standard, if you will. <clears throat> Ultimately, what we're, what we're looking at is what's the quantity of red meat that we can yield out of this carcass? So this is a yield grade two black nose charlet. We would call, uh, this, uh, we might call that a smoky here. Uh, that animal was 50-50 uh, charlet and Angus and we get a yield grade two out of it. Notice, even in the yield grade two, there's some substantial fat that will be trimmed away in the chuck region because of uh, the fat depot. Remember, the animal fattens from front to back, and it's still quite lean in the round, even though there is some what we call star fat here. That's a, uh, that's a lymph node location. You can see some fat in the flank, a little bit of fat deposited next to the tenderloin, a little bit of fat over the back, and other depots here, intermuscular fat depots all throughout the body. In the end, this animal was two-thirds lean, 16% bone, 18% fat. In contrast, what's becoming kind of a normal-looking animal today, uh, an overfinished, uh, earlier maturing Angus, uh, this is a yield grade five critter. So we have copious amounts of trim fat here, Look at the brisket that will be trimmed from this. Uh, excessive seam fat all throughout the front of this animal. Excessive waist fat over the ribeye region. Tremendous amounts of waist fat through the flank and over the porterhouse. And then uh, tremendous amounts of waist fat through the round as well. Uh, this carcass was actually 1% more fat than it was lean. 
So tremendous, tremendous amounts of wasted calories uh, put into that animal <clears throat> to achieve quality. So I'm going to go through carcass discounts and premiums in, in our system. If you have interest, you can look those up. They're reported every day by uh, USDA Market News. And uh, the first one, there's uh, baby teeth, two permanent teeth, and then three or more permanent teeth. So again, every animal is visually mouthed. We do it our, uh, here in our meat lab. Our students do it. Uh, it's done every day at a, at a commercial slaughterhouse. And today's range, I should say last week's range, somebody is, is taking no discount. We'll, we'll pay even money for your 30 plus animal. Somebody is taking $40 a hundred, a hundred weight off, which is a clear signal they don't want to mess with it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to put up with it. They don't want to buy them. They don't want to market them. Don't bring us any more old cattle. Candidly, it's a hassle for us. Uh, and we're, we're very open. If, uh, if people bring us a custom animal, uh, let's say you, you fed a steer or heifer at your home and you brought it to us as a custom, we charge you another $100 if it's a 30 plus because it's a hassle for us to deal with it. It's, a, it's just uh, not something you want to do. So we, we pass that, that cost on to our customers. And SRMs are removed from the human food supply. So we've got to monitor all of that. We've got to document it. How many pounds? Where did it go? What did we do with it? It's another layer of, of hassle they don't want to deal with. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to discount for is carcass weight. So I've got various size carcasses here. This first one is representing those less than 600 pounds. Somebody out there says, we'll take them at no discount. Somebody says, we're going to take $40 a hundred weight off. All across the United States, this weight range is considered par. There's no discount and there's no premium for carcass weight. When we move over to 900 to 1,000, the discounts get smaller, 0 to 15. And then when we get out here at what we call the bombers or the heavyweight carcasses, the uh, discounts increase back up to somebody's got a $50 or 100 weight discount on heavyweights that they are clearly sending a signal that's too big, we don't want them. And I've had a lot of people ask me, why do we care about what the carcass weighs? Well, it's, it all gets down to consistency. And this is a great illustration of lack of consistency. So I actually purchased this package at a Walmart. It was made by some of my friends at Tyson. So I purchased the package, I took a few pictures, and I mailed it to them. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I put a little note in there too about consistency. And uh, I also put a little note in there about quality and consistency and quality. And I think my note probably said something about consistency and fat trim. It was a little bit catty. They didn't think it was near as funny as I did. They did email me back, um, but it, was, it wasn't the humorous note that I sent them. So anyway, you know, right over here, we have a premium choice steak with a ribeye, arguably of about six square inches. And then over here, we have a no roll standard with fundamentally no fat cover. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's okay. That's, that's the his and hers steak, right? His and hers, okay? His and hers, <laughs> right? This will eat like boot leather. This will be juicy and flavorful. I'll eat this first, then I'll help her with the rest of that. <laughs> His and hers. So carcass weight is something that we get to deal with uh, in our industry, and it's only growing. If you're taking notes, I'll ask you to write down that the American steer increases in carcass weight five pounds a year. And the heifer increases six pounds a year. Theoretically, the heifer is going to catch the steer one of these days. They're, uh, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So, we've devised, or started to devise methods to take care of that. Uh, 
based on a, a project, a 4-H project that my son was doing. He did an audit of stakes in the Amarillo Canyon area, and the average ribeye steak sold in, in our market was 14.6 ounces. That's three and a half uncooked servings. Maybe that's a bit big. Maybe, maybe, maybe just a bit big. So what do you do about it? So one of the things that you can do is to remove what we call the cap or the spinalis. So that's a, that's a muscle shown here by this little curve. You can take it off and it's actually a more tender, more flavorful muscle than the ribeye or the longismus muscle. In fact, when I order a steak, I usually embarrass my wife, but when I order a steak, I'll say, hey, bring me a chuck-in steak. And so they'll bring me the steak from this end because it has, or this end, it has a large spinalis and a small ribeye. The spinalis is more tender, more well-marbled, more juicy, more flavorful. That's the one I want. They typically don't get it right, but sometimes they do. <laughs> so anyway, if we separate this first, you can make it into a roast, or you can cut those roasts into little medallions and make them into small steaks. And then this is easier to portion control. That's one way to do it. If you just take that ribeye and cut it in half, eh, it's kind of ugly. It doesn't look like a ribeye anymore. But someday, not too many years from now, that may be what we end up doing. The strip, uh, another proposed method of cutting that strip is to literally cut it in half. Take a strip loin, and instead of you getting a 14-ounce strip, maybe you get half a strip and it weighs 7 ounces. We've actually tried that uh, at the lab and had uh, limited success. Most people still want it to look like a full strip. Uh, they, they understand what you're doing, but they, they don't like it, at least in our experience. All right, moving to quality grade. Uh, this is an interesting time in our, in, our, um, in our grading history. And so you're here for something unique. Select is currently at a premium at at least one packer and a discount at most. And that's a very, very unique situation. Uh, so right now we have one packer out there that's giving a $2 premium for select. Most likely they're trying to fill orders. They probably have boxes they need that ha need to say USDA select on them. And so they've got to incentivize the, the cattle feeder to start bringing some greener cattle in. Less days on feed, less well finished to fill those orders. In contrast, we've also got other packers that are taking $18 off, which sends the signal they need more high quality beef. So, uh, you know, I think um, not, not, uh, this gentleman here, Lance, was talking about our, the diversity of the, the American market, and that's quite true. We have everything. Uh, we need everything in our market because we have ultra wealthy to quite poor, and there's a whole divergent marketplace of American beef products. No roll uh, is always at a discount in our marketing system. Uh, right now, 10 on the low side, up to 68, 100 on the high side. Somebody really does not want to kill a no roll animal. $68, 100 weight off of it. Okay? Yield, yield grades four and five are always discounts. Uh, eight to fifteen dollars a hundredweight off of four, ten to twenty-five dollars a hundredweight off of a five, and so you got to realize they're going to trim this to probably a, an eighth to a quarter inch, and so all of that waste fat goes into edible tallow, edible rendering, and they're trimming all of those pounds off that they paid carcass weight prices for, so there's a discount for that. There's also a discount for dairy type beef. And the reason is primarily a poor muscle to bone ratio. Poor muscle to bone ratio. 
Maximal discount right now is 1400 weight, although there are some packers with none. Uh, those are probably the packers in the dairy regions. So if you go to Tolleson, Arizona, most everything that dies there is a Holstein. If you go to Green Bay, Wisconsin, most everything that dies there is a Holstein. They're not taking any money off because that's really all they're getting. Uh, in contrast here, a beef type animal has a meat to bone ratio of about four to one. So that's a fantastically different number than what we're dealing with over here. Uh, completely different ratio, and it's really evident in those two pictures. There's a whole lot more muscle on the right and a whole lot less on the left. Hard bones uh, also receive a discount. Uh, $18 is the minimal discount. $68 is the maximum right now. We've talked about that. We've got it down. Estrogen is the driver here. Uh, a late cut bull and a heifer are always at risk of being a hard bone. And then we'll get to the dark cutter. Okay. <clears throat> dark cutter at the end of the day is a pH issue. It starts out as long-term stress. So, so a couple of uh, case studies that I'll give you as examples. Um, years ago, I was involved in an experiment in which uh, the nutritionist pulled MGA out of the ration three days before slaughter. So arguably within 24 to 48 hours of pulling it out of the ration, those heifers started cycling. And once they started cycling, that was stress to the body, and they depleted the glycogen reserves in their muscle. And when they got to slaughter, a high, high percentage of them were dark cutters. Okay? Another example that I was involved in, uh, there were some cattle fed at the Clayton Livestock Research Center, which is about uh, two and a half hours, three hours from here to the northwest. And somewhere between Delhart and Texline, the truck blows out some, some tires on the trailer. And he's out in the middle of nowhere between two towns. It's an August day, very hot. These cattle are in a, an aluminum box in 100 plus degree weather in the summertime. They're, they're baking in that box and they're panting, trying to cool their body. And they're panting to such degree that they burn up their muscle glycogen supply. And he sat on the road for like five or six hours trying to get the tires fixed with a fully loaded trailer. And ultimately makes it to the slaughterhouse. The cattle are harvested and it was a nightmare. Near the entire truckload was dark cutters. So it's a, it's a stressful event. The other one uh, that we've been involved in that was memorable was a, a large hailstorm that happened at the local uh, Randall County feedlot. So a thunderstorm passes over uh, extreme hail event, and those cattle were bruised severely. Those that died within the next day or two, uh, extreme bruise trim, and also high, high percentage of dark cutters from that event. And then as time passed, the bruises healed and the dark cutting went away. So it, it's extreme stress. The animal is very stressed and it burns up its muscle glycogen supply. Glycogen in the muscle is what provides fuel to generate lactic acid in anaerobic postmortem metabolism. What we killed and what you'll see next are animals that went through normal pH decline and they'll have a pH approximately 5.6 to 5.7. <coughs> animals that are stressed simply don't have the substrate, the fuel, if you will, to generate lactic acid because they burned it up in the stress event and their pH remains high nearer the normal pH. So what we want to happen is the animal to generate lactic acid in its postmortem metabolism and for the pH to fall. When it remains high, that's what we see on the left as a dark cutter. That muscle will be very high in pH. Normally we say it's somewhere north of six. Uh, often you'll measure up to 6.5, 6.6, 6.7. Uh, when it gets really high, we call those black cutters. They'll approach uh, a black color like some of you are wearing. And that's a, that's a very high pH animal. Does that help any? Good question. Keep asking them. Okay, 
Blood splash is another discount. Again, it's in the range of 10 to 68. Uh, this is a stressful death or the result of a stressful death. So the animal was either poorly stunned or poorly bled and the heart increased, the heart rate increased, the blood pressure increased to the point at which the capillaries could no longer withstand the pressure and they ruptured. It's not a food safety problem, but it's a visual appearance issue because uh, that, that animal will now not be marketed into a retail outlet where the consumer would see it first. It will be marketed into a restaurant where that product is cooked prior to, the, to any visual appraisal. I have no idea. You know, Dr. Tennant, does blood splash occur in a stressful poultry death? So this, uh, this next example is what we call a callus. Technically, that's called steatosis. That is muscle cell death and it's been infiltrated by fat. So what you're looking at is a ribeye. That's the carcass where it would be ribbed between the 12th and 13th rib. And I don't know what happened. I can tell you the muscle fibers died and they were replaced by fat. And this most likely happened early in the animal's life. Maybe it was injured, maybe it was stepped on by another animal, it's, a, it's mother, uh, a sire in the pen, you, you don't know. You, all I can tell you is it, it suffered a, a traumatic muscle injury. The cells died. They filled in with fat. This animal is not able to be graded. And so it is marketed as ungraded or, or no roll beef. All right, then we get to premiums. Again, you can find these at that uh, website any day of the week. The greatest premium is for, quote, unquote, all natural beef. And all natural beef is a lot of things. Or it might be nothing but some marketing. And Angel talked about this a little bit yesterday. So I'm showing you three labels here. Okay? The, the Harris Ranch label on the right meets the legal definition for natural. Minimally processed, no added ingredients, no preservatives. And that would be a, a not an uncommon label that you might find on many, many products in the grocery store. The Nature Well label promoted by National Beef is uh, not in the last 120 days program. So it's marketed as a natural product, but it may or may not meet the definition that some have of natural. That product says... We didn't give an animal an antibiotic or a growth-promoting hormone in the last 120 days of its life, okay? So we have many growth-promoting hormones that would last longer than 120 days now, and some that would arguably last 120 days. So I could give them a, a Cinevex 1 feedlot or a Revelor XS, and they got 80 days more hormone than that program needs. Right? And most of the antibiotic usage, save for Thailand in the feed, would be up front when we're monitoring BRD and trying to get animal health under control. So think uh, your, your Draxons and your Micotils and your Zeprevo, all of that type of usage is in typically the first three weeks of their arrival at feed yard. So that is out of the way long before this would be allowed. Uh, or this would be infringing upon that 120 days. So it may or may not be what the consumer thinks it is. So it's, uh, we, we could call it kind of a quasi-conventional animal, if you will. And the label on the left is probably what most people think natural means. That animal would qualify as what we call a never-ever program. So never in the animal's life did it receive an antibiotic. So either it never had a BRD challenge or we didn't treat it, and it was never administered a growth-promoting hormone. So that would be a, a never ever label. Okay, premiums for those, 
range from $25 to $50 a hundredweight. And most research literature would say you're going to need the one on the right to break even for not using the growth promotant. Uh, the number on the left, you would still be underwater uh, as compared to not using the growth promotant. Uh, NHTC cattle, uh, non-hormone treated cattle, this is a, a pretty much a, a niche market, uh, if you will. This was originally started to meet the European Union quotas for uh, non-hormone treated beef, and then it expanded uh, early into the uh, country natural beef out of Oregon, and later uh, promoted by the Chipotle Mexican Grill. And so you can find uh, bits of this in our market. Uh, I think we, we would all still argue it's still a niche market. Uh, latest data would say that 95% of American cattle receive at least one implant uh, during their lifetime. Prime is typically thought of as a premium, but I can tell you there's at least one packer right now that is offering no more dollars for it. Zero dollars and the other, the other side of that coin, somebody's offering $26 a hundredweight for it. So there's a considerable variance as to how much that is needed for those individual markets. So on the left, this would be high prime, what we call abundant. Average prime or low prime, okay? Pre Go ahead. How is today the price uh, or the carcass weight account for the prime, carcass prime? Carcass prime. Today's price, all right, so today's base price for a carcass is about $198 per hundred weight. $198, that'd be the base price of a choice yield grade three carcass. $198, $198 American dollars per 100 pounds of carcass. That'd be the approximate base price today. Then we would add somewhere in that range, I think the average today is about $13 per hundredweight for a prime, okay? But it ranges vastly depending on individual packer grids, and those are individually negotiated arrangements. Uh, so I'll back down to a premium choice. So this is often marketed as premium choice or upper two-thirds choice. A few packers market these individually. Uh, for instance, I know a packer that, that markets these separately, these high-choice cattle, separately from their average-choice cattle. They have a large supply of both, and they peel those out and separate them and market them two ways. So the original premium choice brand, uh, beginning in uh, 1978, originally uh, developed uh, to support the American Angus Association, was certified Angus beef. I would argue that's the single greatest marketing program ever in the history of ever in the beef world. And there's been several others since then. So this started in 1978, and in 1986, Cargill, uh, XL, it would be the, the name they were known by at the time, said, you know what? Uh, we've got a whole bunch of cattle that are meeting all of these certified Angus beef carcass specifications. They just don't happen to be 51% black. They're red or tan or white or gray or spotted or striped or something else. We're going to market that because that's a fantastic product, but we're going to call it Sterling Silver. And they had quite a bit of success, and they still do today. Then a few years later, Tyson said, hey, Cargill had great success with this non-black CAB program. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to call it Chairman's Reserve. Then a few years later, JBS said, hey, Cargill and Tyson are having some success with this non-black CAB program. We're going to do the same thing. And they called it 1855. And that trend from one branded beef program exploded. Today, there are 93, 93 branded beef programs, all in some form or fashion chasing that original mantra that CAB started. 
We also give premiums for yield grades one and two, uh, zero to eight dollars for a one, zero to five dollars for a two. And so in total, that's kind of what you're looking at when uh, cattle are graded. What is its weight? Notice there's no premium, it's always a discount. Quality discounts versus uh, quality premiums, yield premiums versus yield discounts, and then additional premiums versus additional discounts. You'll notice there's a whole lot more red on there than there is green. And cattle feeding and cattle marketing 101 says you need to worry about minimizing discounts rather than trying to achieve premiums because the discounts are financially much more detrimental than the premiums are beneficial. Okay. So one of, the, one of the things that Angel asked me to include uh, was a comparison to a system that many of you might be aware of, and that is shown right here. Uh, if you go look in our classroom, you'll see a mock-up of this exact thing right here. Uh, we have a fiberglass replica that was used as the calibration model for one of these uh, such devices. So in, in Europe, the common grading of beef is done with the Europe scoring system. It was developed as a muscle conformation scoring system with a heavy muscled bull on the left all the way to a light muscled maybe cow or steer on the right, uh, a much lighter muscled animal. So E, very heavy muscled, Lesser for U, lesser for R, lesser for O, and P is a light-muscled animal. You can really see the difference if you look at the conformation of the round. And on the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, one is a very lean animal, an increasing fat cover for a two, a three, a four, and a five. This was done by human visual subjective appraisal until the year 2000. In 2000, the camera was allowed to do this independent of a human evaluator. And this image shows what the, what the camera was designed to do as the carcass kind of slides along a, a couple of stainless steel uh, devices here. Its conformation is determined with uh, visual imagery uh, and its fat cover is determined with visual imagery as well. And then it's put into those categories. And I could pull up a grid from Europe that would show premiums and discounts based on muscle conformation and fat class.